Good evening. It's about uh, four minutes after seven, so we're quite early for us. Uh, I'm Tom Staley, the director of the Ransom Center, and I'm extremely pleased to welcome you here tonight, especially those of you who are visiting Austin to attend the David Foster Wallace Symposium. On a summer day in 2006, I opened the New York Times and came upon an essay on Roger Federer titled, Federer as a Religious Experience. The successful negotiation of the topspin forehand, I thought, was impossible to describe. Wallace accomplished the impossible. He described the indescribable. This unique talent of his is apparent not just in this particular essay, but throughout Wallace's diverse writings. He was just as adept writing about Tracy Austin's breathtakingly insipid autobiography. That's his quote as he was writing about critic Joseph Frank, and that, that's to say nothing of his remarkable fiction. I think Wallace's essay, Joseph Frank's Dostoevsky, is a model of thoughtful criticism in the midst of murky philosophical waters, and certainly very deep ones. We're delighted that the papers of David Foster Wallace, one of the most important writers of our time, are preserved and accessible for study at the Ransom Center. Tonight, the Ransom Center kicks off its symposium about David Foster Wallace's life, works, and archive, with this event featuring two of Wallace's most significant colleagues, his literary agent, Bonnie Nadell, and his editor, Michael Peach. I can think of no better way to begin our symposium than with a conversation with these two individuals who are so central to bringing David Foster Wallace's writing into public publication. Bonnie and Michael will be introduced more fully in a few moments by our interlocutor this evening, David Ulan. Tonight's event is part of our Harry Ransom Lectures program, our series of distinguished lectures and events featuring internationally recognized writers, artists, and figures in the arts and humanities. We're grateful to George Mitchell and the University Cooperative Society for sponsoring this event and for enriching the intellectual life of our campus through their support of this lecture series. We're fortunate to have one of the nation's most perceptive and esteemed book critics as our moderator this evening. David Ulan is book critic for the Los Angeles Times, where he served as book editor from 2005 to 2010 and established the paper's book section as one of the most important in the country. He's the author of The Lost Art of Reading, Why Books Matter in a Distracted Time, and The Myth of Solid Ground, Earthquakes, predic Prediction, and the Fault Line Between Reason and Faith. He's also the editor of two anthologies of Southern California literature. His essays and criticism have appeared in such publications as the Atlantic Monthly, The Nation, The New York Times Book Review, LA Weekly, Book Forum, and on National Public Radio's All Things Considered. I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator this evening, David Ulan. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I spent the entire day in the manuscript room looking at manuscripts, and I think I need to move here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to briefly introduce um, the, 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 the talent um, for the event. Um, Bonnie Nadell, to my far left, is president of the Hill Nadell Literary Agency, which is based in Los Angeles. She became David Foster Wallace's agent in 1985, which we'll be talking about, and has represented all of his books since then. And to my immediate left is Michael Peach, who is the executive vice president and publisher of Little Brown and Company, which he joined in 1991 after working at Scribner and Harmony Books. He worked with David Foster Wallace as editor on Infinite Jest, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, brief interviews with hideous men, Consider the Lobster, Oblivion, and edited, um, in many ways, um, really constructed what we know of, uh, or what we hold, the, the document we hold in our hand as, uh, as The Pale King, which came out, um, came out last year. Before we start, I'd like to thank Tom Staley um, for his generosity and for this magnificent um, event. Megan Bernard, Danielle Ziegler, the Ransom Center um, in general, 
Um, and I think we should thank David Foster Wallace, who is really the reason we're all here tonight. So at the risk of appearing like an Angelino, which I guess I am at this point, having lived there for a long time, I'm going to take out my little insidious device here because it's the only timepiece that I have. I don't wear a watch. So um, I'm only going to look at it periodically just to make sure that we're keeping track of the time. I promise I won't take any calls. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to, uh, we, we, well, we, we sort of talked a little bit before about how, to, how we wanted to talk. And one of the things that we thought we would do is, is start with some broad context stuff, um, talking to, I asked Bonnie and Michael a little bit about how they started working with David, some of the history um, of, of their work together and his career, and then we kind of would hopefully move, uh, the narrative arc will hopefully take us up to, uh, up to and into um, the Pale King. So I'm going to start, and um, hopefully it will also become a conversation rather than a dual interview, and now I'm putting the pressure on you guys. Um, we'll, we'll start, so, but Bonnie, we'll start with you because you started working with David First, and you know the, the famous story, which I guess is not apocryphal, but maybe a little apocryphal, is that you plucked um, his samples off of the slush pile when you were a young agent, and when he was uh, he was still in graduate school. Was he? He was still at. Uh, so is that right? Um, that is correct. I was. I had moved to San Francisco from New York, where I had worked in publishing, and I became an agent. But I became an agent with no clients and no books, and so. <laughs> My job was to answer the phone and to read through the, what's known as the slush pile, which is the manuscripts that are unsolicited that come to an agency. And the man I worked for at the time, um, who's now deceased, is named Fred Hill. And when I got there, there were piles and piles of, piles of manuscripts that he had not been reading. So I started reading them. And David, at that point, was getting his MFA at the University of Arizona at Tucson. And he sent in what was the eighth chapter of Brim of the System and sent a letter where it said he had graduated from Amherst, top of his class, and he had written this novel as part of his senior thesis, and he used the word diachronic. And I didn't know what the word diachronic meant. So first thing I had to do was look up what it meant, um, and that it meant out of order, and that he was sending the eighth chapter as opposed to the first chapter, which is, of course, what you always tell people to send when you're an agent. And since I had nothing to do and I had no clients, I could read way faster than anyone else who he had submitted the manuscript to. And I fell in love with this book. Um, it was about, it was set in college. It was set with people, you know, with young people who were sort of adrift and just starting their lives. And I read this diachronic chapter probably within a day <laughs> and asked him to send me all of Brim of the System. And I remember sitting in cafes in San Francisco reading it. And then calling him up, and those were the days, of course, before internet, before cell phones, so you literally had to call someone until they answered the phone. Um, and David had no answering machine and no way to find him. And it turned out we had gone to very similar colleges on the East Coast. He had gone to Amherst, I had gone to Williams, which are two, they're rivals and they play each other in football every year, so we, even though we didn't know each other in college, we essentially knew, very, had very similar experiences. And I said, I love this book, and I wanted to take it out. And I sold it fairly quickly, um, though there was only one person in New York who wanted to buy it at the time. And so David was published. We started very young. I mean, I was 25. He was 24 at the time. And that's how we started with Broom of the System. I just want to add that you didn't submit it to me, or maybe there would have, maybe there would have been two. Who knows? Right, but <laughs> knows? Th that's because I didn't know you yet. So I remember hearing some stories about David at the MFA program in Arizona, and that is it true that he was not welcome there, and that his work was considered wildly impossible by this by the right, by the teaching staff there? He was not a favorite of the of the school. I think was part of the problem is that at the time in the early, mid '80s, like you'll remember this, the two of you will remember this. The style was very different. It was Raymond Carver. Um, it was very minimalist fiction. And what David was writing was this wild, crazy novel with the great Ohio desert in it and characters with names like Stone Cipher Beadsman. And this was not what people were looking for. People were 
looking for novels of like people who are drinking and saying four words in a chapter. And Broom of the System was set slightly in the future, so that there was that kind of, um, even though it's not a work of science fiction really, there is a little bit of that futuristic thing. This is, I think, before, before genre fiction really sort of shed its, its um, the stigma of genre fiction a certain way, right? So he's playing around in, in what for a literary program is taboo territory a little bit. Right, that's true, right, because it was, you know, it was the Great Ohio Desert, there was sewage everywhere, things had names, and he was, he sort of took off on his own flight of fancy. So, Michael, she didn't send you Broom of the System. I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't know you yet. We, we, hadn't met, we hadn't met each other. We'll have to investigate this a little but, further. But then she did, she did what, it, what literary agents do is this gradual seduction, gradual seduction process. So she had placed uh, the Broom of the System with a very good publisher. Yes. But for some reason, she was sending out stories he wrote to other editors saying, you might like this guy. And once I received a magazine, this little magazine called The Rival, um, with a story called Linden in it, I believe, which is a story that was then collected in his, included in his first, um, his first collection of stories. And I had not read Room of the System yet, but I read this short story, and uh, it, it is a story about Lyndon Johnson's secretary who's dying of AIDS, and it was just the wildest piece of fiction I'd ever held in my hands in my life. I'd never read anything remotely like it, and it, it kind of sent me sent me uh, adrift uh, in, in bliss. And um, so Bonnie did a little, you know, <laughs> she sent me another story. And then, and then eventually there came a moment when she and, and uh, she, David was in New York, and, and she invited me to, to meet him. Um, and I said, I would love to meet this writer. And we had an awkward dinner, right? We did. We all had dinner. And um, in, I think, a Mexican dive downtown. And David, at that point, still was unsure of sort of what one did or how one acted in these situations, but I think we actually had a very nice dinner. I think we had, a, I remember he didn't eat uh, dairy, and I remember also that my bold tactic was to tell him how much I loved um, his, his, his women characters. I thought for a young male writer, he, his, um, his idea of what the inside of a, of a woman's, woman's mind might be like um, felt very, very intriguing and true to me. Um, not that I knew anything. <laughs> um, but I also remember I told him that having read, that having read The Broom of the System, I don't think I would have had the courage to have published it. I thought it was a kind of wildly difficult, challenging book. And, I, and I, at that point in my career, I know it wouldn't have had a chance in hell of getting it acquired by uh, the, power, the, the companies I worked for. And that sort of uh, reverse gambit, I think, sort of helped him trust me or something. So, right. so this is interesting. I mean, in, in terms of kind of the courting process, right, or courting Michael as an editor, I mean, you... you I, Identified Michael as a as a, a a good viable editor for David's work early on. Um, how did that? I mean, from from your end, Michael, when you first started reading the stories, did was this? You know, you said the, the the wildest piece of fiction you ever read. Did it? Did it immediately? Did did he immediately seem to be someone you'd want to publish? And did you begin kind of strategizing how to publish it? Was the atmosphere? I just want to kind of set the context. Was the atmosphere even within a publishing house at that point where the you know the the tendency was towards sort of minimalist, realist fiction. Um, I mean, was this a hard sell? Did you think it was going to be a hard sell? It was, um, it was a moment, uh, and David wrote a very good essay about this, in which very young literary writers were suddenly prized, because this was around the time at, at, when uh, the triumvirate, Jay McInerney, Brady Stanellis, and Tama Janowitz were suddenly all the bestsellers, and just being 27 years old suddenly was, was, had commercial value, which it doesn't usually have. Right, and they so, were all called the Brat Pack. You may remember the Brat Pack movies. Some and it was them. also the moment when trade paperbacks were really uh, vintage, had the vintage contemporary series, Penguin had contemporary American fiction. So all of a sudden, trade paperback as a first publication venue was gaining a lot of credibility. So you could bring out books, I guess, more, le less expensively, um, smaller advances, right, than, than you would have taken a risk on a young writer. So there was, there, was, there was an atmosphere where everyone was looking for, everyone was always looking for brilliant new writers. And it seemed like there was, it was a moment when, um, that you might be able to get some attention from them because these other young writers were getting a lot of attention. And I was always just uh, drawn to, to writers' voices that were unlike other voices I'd heard, and this was uh, as singular a voice as I'd encountered. The way my counter-seduction worked was uh, what you do is you send books and you write letters, and back those, those were days when you wrote letters, and my files, which arrived at the Ransom Center today, all the little Browns files are part of the collection here, will be part of the collection here. Um, these long, long letters we wrote back and forth about books we'd read and books I'd sent him and what he was reading, and I sent him some of the books that I had edited or liked and that he, he, re he responded to. 
So through that, we kind of formed some sense of sympathy as, as readers. And I guess he was forming, in some level, an idea of someone who, if, in the future, should he ever change publishers, he might enjoy working with. Exactly. And um, I mean, part of what's in the archives are so, some early rejection letters, actually, from a whole lot of magazines and places. Because, I mean, what you all have to understand is David Foster Wallace didn't become David Foster Wallace for probably about a decade until Michael published Infinite Jest. And so there were years of people saying, gee, not for us. Or that's interesting, but really not for us. <laughs> and these stories were outlandish. They were totally different than what other people were doing. And the only people I could get to publish these stories were tiny magazines run by people out of their apartments, their garages. I mean, all these magazines that had published his early stories are long out of business. They don't even exist anymore. And. Um, it was one of these things where those were, you know, where getting a writer published and getting a writer known is part of what an agent's job is. And of course, it's very hard to get a writer known when these magazines are printing a thousand copies out of a garage. But these were the stories that I would send Michael and say, like, look, another story you should read. Right. And actually, in some of his really early influential stuff, uh, e Unibus Plurum, the essay about irony, that appeared in the Review of Contemporary Fiction. Right. Great magazine, but with a circulation of about 500, right? So, um, and I believe he edited the issue in which that essay appeared, so he was his own assigning editor. Always a, a great benefit for a writer, I think. Um, this essay is much too short. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. We can give you the whole issue. Um, so it really switched. So Infinite Jest is the, I mean, it's clearly the, the turning point where David becomes a cultural signifier in a certain sense. Let's talk about how, um, how Infinite Jest came, not necessarily how it came into being from a writing point of view, but how it came into being as a, as a published book, since this is, Michael, your first book with him as well. Well, the way it started is that I had sent, my, David had sent me about 250 pages of the book, which I had submitted to Jerry Howard, who at that point was David's editor, and we couldn't come to terms, and so I had sent that it means to- not enough money. Right. Well, I was being the polite way of saying that. And so I sent it to Michael and a few other people. And Michael, at that point, was at Little Brown and in a position where he could offer more money. And that's how we started. Of course, what we didn't know at the time is that those 250 pages were only an eighth of the book. <laughs> um, at the time, we thought it was probably about half the book. I'm sure David knew it wasn't half the book, but he luckily did not tell us that at the time. <laughs> and Michael, how did, from your point of view, how did, uh, once you saw those 250 pages, you, you bought the book off of the 250 pages? That's correct. It was, okay. uh, it was sold long before it was, it was complete. I guess he was at a point he needed money to finance, uh, to nice. live on while he wrote it. And, um, I had the enormous pleasure of reading those opening pages. And the conversation that I recall, and I, don't, I hope it's not entirely reconstructed from wishful thinking, was that he said he was looking for an editor who he felt he would listen to when the editor made suggestions to, per, to perhaps shorten the work, because he knew that the, pre, the editor he'd worked with before, they had these epic battles, but David said he never ended up changing anything. I don't know if that's true, but that's, that, that's the way he, he described it to me. And he thought, that I looked mean enough that he might, uh, and old enough that he might uh, listen to my suggestions for, because he, and he said this because he knew he was writing something very, very long, and we all really didn't understand what he meant when he said very, very long. Right, but right. See, but 600,000 words long, right? Was, yeah. And that's after, after, that's, that's, that's after cutting. So, that's after so talk, I mean, I wonder, can you talk about this process, because this is really interesting to me, the, the relationship between a writer and an editor, the role that, a, edit, that an editor takes in kind of, um, helping a writer shape a work, thinking, um, helping a writer think through a work like that, especially a novel like this where in some ways you become almost a creative partner, a creative collaborator in some way. I mean, how, what was the process like working on um, editing Infinite Jest? As, did you do it as he was writing it? Did you read big chunks and offer, offer notes? The, the, the process, it, 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 it's different in each case because your editor's job is to work with the writer in the way that the writer wants to be worked with. And David after those 250 pages, went away for quite a long, long time to write. And he wrote and wrote and wrote. And at some point, he felt that he wanted um, some res a response. So he sent me a, man a partial manuscript of, I think, six or 700 pages and asked for a response. And you can imagine, if, if, uh, I assume if people in this room have read Infinite Jest, 
reading half that book, how can you imagine the shape of the rest of it enough to give a comment? And so, I mean, so, but that, that was what he asked me for, and so I said, I'm, this is obviously provisional because I don't know where it's going yet. So all I can tell you is, is reading in, this, in, in these chapters in this order, I can tell you the points at which I'm feeling really, really confused. I mean, also the points where I'm feeling incredibly happy and delighted, an editor's first and primary job is always to express abundant, overwhelming delight and show that you, that you appreciate what the writers set out to do because if they, don't, if, you, if they don't feel that you appreciate and understand what they set out to do, why are they going to listen to you when you make suggestions for changes? So um, I don't mean to be talking only about the, 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 uh, the things that were, that were um, the other things which I was told him about, which were the, these are the moments where I just felt really confused or I really had a hard time staying awake. And it was just, the, it was very, very long and so I just told him the parts where I just really was really counting a lot on the remaining pages to explain something that I really, really didn't understand now. So it was kind of a provisional response just to let him know where it was hard, because he, he wanted the book to be infinitely entertaining. He knew it was, gonna, it was gonna be long, so he wanted to be sure people were really having fun all the way through. So the, the first partial response was on that, on that measure. Okay. And, then, and then another, finally, uh, a long time later, he sent in the whole, the, 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 the complete work. And, uh, and that was a long summer of reading and uh, taking notes and taking, you know, just trying to chart it, just make a map of it. And, uh, and then we had started this epic co correspondence, um, just it's all in the archive, page after page of just page number, what's going on here, page number, I don't understand this page number, please cut this footnote. And then in the archive also is David's notes, which he sent, uh, which I didn't see, but um, just in the margin, sort of a check mark saying, meaning yes, an angry face he would draw saying, not in my life. <laughs> uh, and and, um, and through, this, through several round, rounds of this, he, he, um, he, he compressed the novel, he shortened it. He took some passages that were sort of some past, uh, long chapters that were written in the point of voice of someone uh, uh, for whom English was not their first language, and they were trying to be confusing. He realized that was too many stages of, uh, of, of, uh, of um, concealment. Uh, so he, 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 uh, he took some things out. He, he um, took out some wonderful things, which were in the archive, because the pact, insofar as we had a pact, was the book should be as short as it possibly could be and still be itself, because of the, just the demands of an 1,100-page book on reading time and just knowing people do not approach massive works readily. So the, the goal was that um, if it could come out and the book did not collapse in on itself, it would come out. And then a lot of things got put back in. And a, a response to one, a, an early suggested deletion was this chapter introduces three characters, four major themes, and the setting, but fine, take it out. And he did, because all that stuff came up, came, came up, uh, comes up later. It was a great delight of my life as an editor working with him. It was, I've never Not had bad. anything remotely as delightful as that, uh, that exchange. And my contention as the editor is that, you know, the editor doesn't exist. You're just someone who help, is helping the writer think. And any change that he makes is the change that he made because that's the book he wanted. How long did the process take? I don't really remember how many months it was. Bonnie might remember. She's probably getting a whole different set of course, but letters at the time, like, I he's taking forever, he's gonna... destroying my life. Um, I did get a few of like, he's not answering. Why isn't he answering? Does he hate the book? I'm like, no, he doesn't hate the book. He has to read 11. I think at the beginning, it was 1,600 pages. It came in something that was this big. If you, you know, if you hurled it, hurled it at someone, you probably could have killed them. Um, and I was reading along at the time, and I was, David used to tell me I didn't have um, an abstract bone in my body, um, which he meant both as a compliment and an, and an insult, um, because I'd be like, I don't get this. Um, and so between the two of us, we would cut it. And David also, he, despite the length of how he wrote, he was actually really good about cutting. He was not someone who was like, don't change a comma, don't change a period. He was always someone who was willing to listen to an editor, a magazine editor, a publishing editor, and was willing to work with someone and, and change it and cut it. Um, I mean, I see Deborah here, who worked with David at The New Yorker, nodding, because she'll remember this too. I mean, he, he was actually really reasonable for someone who had such a clear view of what he wanted something to be. He really did listen some of the time. I think he loved it. I think yes. being, working with, I think what he loved best was working with copy editors 
the people whose, the professionals whose job it is to make sure that the parallel semicolons line up and that your grammar is correct, because that was a challenge at the level that he just like, yes, someone who knows what these, <laughs> what this, what these terms mean and how language is actually constructed. Um, I think it was a, a form of, of delightful play for him in, in, in some ways. Right. I mean, he, he, the sparring was half the fun. But I would think that would have been. Right. Well, I mean, because then you're talking about the language as the, I mean, as the, I mean, obviously it's the medium, but the language is also the subject in a lot of cases, I think. I mean, that's, to me, the great tension or balance in the work is the play between the narrative and the language and how, how precise the language is and how much attention to that linguistic detail is there, which is, you know, what copy, copy editors do. Once... So once that book came out and established him in some way, now, I mean, in a way, the, the team was in place, or the team is in place. Um, you know, long-term relationship, writer, it's the dream situation for a writer, you know, long-term relationship with an agent, long-term relationship with an editor, both of whom get the work, um, treasure it, and, and want to present it in the best possible way. What is, um, you know, what was the progression? I mean, how did, what, in terms of the next book, it was, there were, um, there was, excuse me, there was, uh, you know, a lot of collections. There wasn't another novel. We'll, we'll get to in a minute about, about The Pale King. Or there, it was, there was difficulty, I guess, in, in terms of a novel. What's the, you know, where does, from your point of view, where does, how did it move on from, uh, from Infinite Chess? Well, I'm just throwing this out to either one of you or, or both of you. Well, the editing process was going on for Infinite Jest, David was starting to write nonfiction. And some of the best loved essays, um, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, where he takes a cruise, um, the one about the state fair. Um, he was starting to do essays partly because he needed money and partly because he realized that they were really fun to do. And that's some of what we'll talk about tomorrow um, at the panel about magazines. And so the next logical step after Infinite Jest was to do, collect some of these essays because they were in diff different magazines that were Harper's and then obviously some of these very small magazines and that was the next book that Michael did which was um, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. And that's how it kept going. And David, what he was doing is he was constantly writing, there were stories and essays, particularly stories that he had been writing all along. I mean stories he would have started as an MFA student, stories he would have written while he was a teacher and that some were folded into Infinite Jest, some of them wound up being part of The Pale King, which we didn't realize until we started working on it, that there were always pieces that wound up being taken from one place to another and voices and characters who would reappear. And so that's how, um, so the next book was nonfiction, and then the book after that was Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, and then another collection of essays. No, then Oblivion, no, Oblivion and then next, Consider right? the Lobster. Consider the lobster. So, um, so the output of work continued, though, Clearly, David was working on The Pale King all along, but none of us um, were seeing it at the time. Well, before we go to The Pale King, so is there, um, in terms of the archive, I feel like we should talk a little bit about that, too. Is, is there um, a lot of unpublished work in the archive, a lot of, of those kind of stories that weren't folded into or used for, um, either weren't published in collections or weren't folded into Infinite Jest or weren't folded into The Pale King? What kind of um, unpublished material is in the archive? There's a, there will be published later this year a collection of previously unpublished non essays, um, some of which go very, very far back, um, and one of which is the Roger Federer essay. The collection is called Both Flesh and Not, and the title that was the, at the, the archive has this, the original title in which uh, David gave that essay was Roger Federer, Both Flesh and Not. And, one of the, and the original title of uh, the title of the first essay collection, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, was the title he had given the cruise ship essay. And uh, Harper's Magazine insisted on a different title for, for um, reasons of length or aesthetic reasons. He always delighted in restoring his full intent <laughs> in, uh, in book form for essays, about which sometimes there are space reason, uh, limitations on, on them. Uh, so there's a fair, there are 20, 20, I think, essays in this collection. Um, that had not appeared before, including one, as I mentioned earlier, fictional, uh, fictional Futures and the conspicuous, Conspicuously Young, a, an essay about what it's like to be a young writer and have your youth be a commodity, and then uh, some, of the, some of the most recent essays. Yes, and then the other part that's in it are some of the vocabulary words, since, as everybody knows, David loved dictionaries and loved words, and so 
the last thing we're figuring out about this book is sort of the number of words and definitions to put into it. Among his papers were hundreds of pages of just words with definitions. Just he was constantly teaching himself new words by writing them down and writing down the definition. And you get you, it's hundreds of pages of words I've never seen before. Right, and it's amazing how many words we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've now found out. How many words I really have no idea what they mean. So I think we are likely to run those on the end papers the way the tax form doc names ran on the end papers of the Pale King. And besides that book of essays, is there are there plans for other work coming out of uh, other published other books coming out of the archive? How, how much more material do you think there is? Um, there's not much more material. There's a collection of uncollected fiction, just as there is nonfiction, um, which go, or stories that go way back, and stories, some of which have been pu were published in tiny magazines, and some stories that were not published at all. And so that would be the last work is that we know of. That goes all the way back to his first published story, this, which appeared in the Amherst, Amherst Magazine, is that right, correct? Right, in 1984. Right. So it goes back to sort of when he was still trying on voices, and other voices other than his own. Well, let's talk about the Pale King um, a little bit. Let's, I mean, let's talk about what you guys know about the genesis of it, the, the sort of history of it before, you know, what, what the work process was. At what point do you, what, at what point did David start working on it? We think he probably started working on it in about 1997 or 1998. <clears throat> we realized he was taking accounting courses when he was teaching in Illinois that he was teaching at um, ISU, and he was taking a bunch of accounting courses. And David was, not only was he an amazing writer, but he understood math at a level that was very high. And so he had, we found all these accounting books and all these sort of tax documents, and he was really studying the tax code in order to understand what he, that if you're trying to be an IRS agent, you actually have to understand the tax code. And he also, found this list of things where it's like how to scam the IRS, how to you know, pretend, pretend to go bankrupt, all sorts of things that he used like for a line or two that wound up in The Pale King. And you can imagine my delight when Bonnie called me and told me David's working on a book about the IRS. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that from an right. editor's point of view, a novel about the IRS. That's a, that, that, that's a bestseller, yeah? It's, it's, what we were, it's what we were hoping. We actually had a, had, a, had a focus group and were trying to determine what he should do next, and that was what right. we came up with. Right. Right. <laughs> no, no. Because taxes are the thing that everybody really wants to read about all the time. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I was having lunch with a friend of mine, a writer in L.A. about a month ago, and The Pale King came up, and he said, this is this is genius to write about because this is the thing everybody is obsessed with. <laughs> we're all worried we're going to get audited. We all, you know, and, and, and all of those rooms, this is a guy who's just been audited, okay? So um, <laughs> all of those rooms, you know, those agents are listening to stories. It's just a place where it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a, a collector. They collect stories. That's what they do. You're telling stories. You're telling the story why you shouldn't pay more money or, or whatever. It was an interesting filter through which to, to read the book. I read it through a somewhat different filter, no less compelling, I think, but, um, but it is the universal thing, right? I mean, I think he was working, he was trying to think of, I, he's written essays about trying to, he, how he was trying to grasp the world at a, the most human, basic, universal level. He wrote essays about, against irony and in favor of direct connection with human beings. And I think he was trying to think about what do we all share? And, and the, it's right there in front of us, death and taxes. He wrote, set out to write a book about death and taxes. And, um, but I, just, I, I heard just this, this occa very occasional. David worked very privately with regard to me. He, I would talk to him about the collections he was assembling, and it was very clear to me he did not enjoy being probed about, how's the new novel coming, David? He told me he was working on something. He told me he was working on a long thing, as he called it. He called it among other things. But he was, it made him very, very anxious. Um, so I mostly asked Bonnie how it was going, um, and from time to time he would, he would use the long, the fact that he was working on a long thing to get out of doing other things we wanted him to do in connection with promoting a, a, an essay collection or a story collection. Um, but it was, I didn't, I didn't really see a word of it or really know beyond these few words from Bonnie what he was, what he was writing for all those years, just that he was working on a novel. 
Right, because you can imagine when someone says, I'm doing a novel about accounting and the IRS in the 80s. And I think my response was, huh. A long, a long novel. A long about novel about well, When that. David says long, you tremble. And you know <laughs> he means long, right? Right, it's like, no kidding. Um, and you know, none of us saw any of it until obviously after his death. So um, you, never saw any, you never saw any of it until, you, you never saw pages? No. Okay. No, I mean, there were tiny bits of it that he published. Um, there was a story called Good People that was in the New Yorker, which was a story about a, a very a Christian young man and woman, um, and she's pregnant, and that story is part of The Pale King, but at the time we didn't know it. Um, there was a story about an IRS agent and a very creepy baby. Um, that was published, but we didn't know. At the time, they were just pieces unto themselves, and we didn't really understand how they fit into a whole. No, there, there, there another story called The Soul is Not a Smithy, which is a story that explores the hallucinatory expanses of boredom and a ch children in a junior high school uh, classroom, it, um, which is an amazing piece of work, which when we began reading the novel, it was clear that that was a piece that he had also conceived as part of this larger story and then decided to publish on his own. Do you think that, I mean, he clearly had trouble. I mean, you, the book made him very anxious. He had trouble in terms of piecing it together. I mean, it was a long, complicated project. Do you think that, um, or do either of you or both of you think that um, Infinite Jest cast a certain shadow that it was hard for him that the book was so iconic in so many ways that it was that that was a that it added an additional layer of pressure, in terms of, or do you think that it was just grappling with the material in the Pale King? I think it probably did add another level of pressure. I mean, David always wanted to be able to go beyond where he'd gone before, and so when Infinite Jest became so successful, because I think until its publication, none of us were really clear this was going to work, because it's very hard to know that people will actually devote the time to an 1,100-page book. And I do remember, I mean, and Michael and Little Brown had a lot of courage, because at some point, there were people who, prob who said to you, could you cut this? Could you cut this in half? Like, I mean, I think there were people who wanted you to cut it a lot at the time. And when it became this iconic book, it did create enormous pressures. I mean, David was a very ambitious writer to begin with. He was not someone who would ever rest on his laurels. And even doing nonfiction pieces where once these various funny, wonderful essays came out, people were like, oh, can you do another one like that? And the answer was always like, well, no, I don't want to do what I already did. And for him, he felt the fiction was always the hardest thing he ever, it's the hardest thing for him. And so, there were times where he would be like, I don't want to do any more magazine pieces. I want to keep writing this long thing. And he used it as much an excuse to me as he did to publishers, which is like, no, I'm working on it. It's going to be ready. And, um, and it, he'd been working on it for years. I mean, I certainly think there was a 10-year period where he was working on this book on and off. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you have a um, you, As Bonnie said, he was, his, ambitious was, his ambition was... was of the highest magnitude, and I think he wanted to be uh, to write something that did not feel to him like it was like Infinite Jest, and Infinite Jest encompassed, encompassed so much. I think he, he was, my, my sense was that he was striving to arrive at forms and voices that he had not uh, achieved before. At the same time, I think he was struggling with the material, because writing, he said himself, what appears to me and th to be the greatest challenge a writer can set to write a book about boredom, that, that, whose essence is the subject of boredom and how life, the, 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 the most mundane, repetitious aspects of human experience, which is the experience we have most often, and the extent to that, which that warps and informs our lives and, and how we have to battle through that to re arrive at anything that matters. That is the greatest challenge. It's the opposite of, of what fiction does usually. Fiction cuts away those, you know, the, there's the famous quote from Melmore Leonard, uh, which is that his book started selling when he finally learned to leave out the parts that people skip. Yeah. People just compress around, <laughs> compress around drama, compress around the excitement, and uh, that's what most fiction is. And his, he set himself the task of the opposite, expanding around the dull parts, and, but then around the subject of dullness, but making it 
ecstatically engaging. That's the challenge. I just think it was an almost superhuman challenge that he was, that he was working at incredibly hard and with, uh, in my view, extraordinary, extraordinary success. So let's talk about how the book got put to, how, how the book as we know it, because I think, you know, I mean, clearly it's, it's put together as an unfinished novel. It's put together as a conditional project. We don't know what the, what the finished form was intended to be or what it might have been. Um, let's talk about how that got, first, I mean, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about how the book got put together. Monty, why don't we start with you talking about sort of what you found and at what point you thought there was something there. Well, we knew there was something there from the very beginning. There was no question there was something there. Um, when Karen Green, David Swidow, and I went into the garage, which was his office, which was the spookiest place I think I'd ever seen in my entire life. Um, there was a manuscript stacked on his desk, so it's not like we didn't know it was there. Um, spooky, can you just elaborate on spooky why? Spooky, dark, um, it felt haunted. I mean, at the beginning, it felt haunted. I mean, not to mention the spiders, the, the, mil the like 25 lamps from the thrift store and everything else that was sort of in this room. Um, and so there was a period of time between when we knew it existed and when we actually decided to do something about it. But um, that chunk that was about, what, about a 200, 250 page manuscript chunk that was sitting on the desk, right? That was spotlighted in, in some way or... Right, I mean there was a lamp on it, yes. Right. Um, the, that turns out to just be, uh, I mean, well, Michael, I can ask you that, that, that isn't a fully self-contained unit. I mean, that got, not all of that made it into the finished book. The, the book as we know it now, or as we hold it, is much different from that pile of paper. Well, that part was what we thought was the beginning, which is the character of David Wallace going to the IRS headquarters, and it's him it's a character named David Wallace who's on this excruciating bus ride with, with screaming children and it's hot and he's sweating and then he's on this horrible car ride with these other IRS agents who are all sweating next to him. And we all thought that was the beginning at the time because it was sort of a very complete and very polished section. And then of course it was only later as Michael was going through it that he realized it was not the first section because it seems like the opening chapters, but it wasn't the opening chapters. It turned out to be about the middle. Right. Chapter eight. No, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, <laughs> can you talk about the process of, from an editor, editorial point of view, the, for, I guess first just the process of excavation? Well, the process began when the, with the, um, I was invited by Bonnie and David's wife, Karen, to uh, come to her home and their home and, uh, and look at these uh, pages that they had begun to read and to um, see everything that they had found in his office that pertained to this novel that carried the title The Pale King uh, in, in his files. And um, so I spent an afternoon with them in, in, uh, in their home um, and in the garage and Karen and Bonnie had gone through his files and pulled out everything that looked like it was a piece that was titled The Pale King or Novel in Progress or anything like that. And it was a mass of material in plastic tubs and bags, in in wire baskets, um, and uh, it, it was it was a novel in progress. I mean, I've, I've never written a novel, but I assume every writer has a lot of a lot of stuff that they work their way through, and eventually you have something neat at the end. And David died before you got to the neat at the end part, so all the pieces were, were there and, and pulled out. And I first took this this chunk, the, uh, the 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 portion on the desk back to the hotel I was staying at and began reading there and um, had a kind of ecstatic experience of encountering David as a character in a book that he'd written. It was, it was, it was in this very grievous time, but uh, delightful. Um, and I saw, and I was thrilled to see how full and polished these chapters were, that he had, he had I'd, I'd never seen a word of it, and so he, I saw that he had completed great portions of this work. And the first chapter is called Authors Forward, and I did think, this is the Authors Forward, this is where it begins. Um, Karen and Bonnie gave me leave to take all this material back home because it, would have, it was clearly a long, long, long 
Uh, well, you would have had to move to Claremont. I would have had to move to Claremont uh, <laughs> for, for a couple of years. Um, and, just, and I just began reading in just whatever order I found it. But first of these first 150 pages, which were beautifully polished and turned out to be a portion that David had pulled together in order, he was contemplating sending it in to, for a new contract. Um, so that's why this, these chapters were polished up to the highest sheen. Um, and all those chapters did, did end up in the book, of course. Okay. Um, but uh, then there were more than something like 3,000 pages of, of manuscript in various forms, a lot of it variant drafts of, of the same chapter, but this enormous mass. And as I read, I've, until you know, reading just that 150 pages or 250 pages, it's not a novel. It's, not even, it's, a, it's an abstract portion of a, a, it's a shard. Right. But as I read everything else, I saw this enormous world that he had invented with ex this ex With all these characters. Um, who, who we're, what we realized at some point is that we were seeing all their early lives and then we were seeing them as adults, as IRS agents, and that there's a, that essentially it's like, how do they get there? And they all have these completely tortured childhoods for various reasons, and that clearly made them all into IRS agents. Um, <laughs> but that's, um, that was, that that was took, the puzzle. it took a while yeah. to sort of understand who these children were. And also what David would do is change names all the time. <laughs> and so there was a long process where we had to figure out that the character who had one name on page you know, 20 was the same character on page 500. And that was, you know, that was a big process because he was always trying out different names. And then he would switch them and change the characters' names. And that made it a little bit more interesting. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, uh... It, it was it was a great puzzle why how these pieces these childhood pieces fit together with the with the this uh, this main story about these these uh, IRS agents coming to work, dealing with work, living through the extraordinary extraordinary tedium of their of their of their work, and then these these ex insane difficult uh, uh, childhoods. Um, but eventually, it became clear that the, there was finally a moment when the same name appeared in a child and one of the characters in the IRS. This is, these are the fucked up childhoods of, of, these, of, these, of these characters. And the reason the author's forward um, finally emerged not to be the opening of the book was in a footnote. Um, and then in a draft, much more clearly in the footnote, it stated that uh, for legal reasons, the uh, publishers, the lawyers of Little Brown and Company have required that this uh, author's forward be put this number of pages away from the start because they want to, they're forcing the writer David Wallace to conceal the fact that this is actually all nonfiction. Right. And so that was part of the conceit of the book that the author's forward couldn't be at the start because of because right. it was too troubling. Because it's really a memoir of being an IRS agent. Yes. Um, none of which is actually true. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that? I mean, you know, at, at the risk of getting into tricky material, what is that like to to put? I mean, for you, Michael, what was that like to sit and try and figure out what this book was, what this book looked like, or uh, you know, obviously, it is in all these, it's in these fragments that are in different states of completion. There are hints about how things fit together. You're just talking about sort of the detective work involved in, in figuring out where the author's forward needs to go. Um, but yet, in the end, it's an entirely conditional process. I mean, you've talked about this before, that it really is your version. The book that exists is your version as the editor of, of what the book might look like or what the book might have been intended to look like. So I wonder if you can talk a bit about that, that puzzle making it was process. A, yeah, it was an enormous, enormous puzzle, um, and it was uh, it was a it was a very long process because it involved just reading and reading and reading and reading, just reading all the way through, taking enormous notes, sort of getting it all up in your head, so, and then reading again with just with that with that rough sense that you have in your head, with, and taking even more notes, saying starting to identify the strands. And I have enormous. I, I won't hold them up because they'll look small to you, but I have these color-coded spreadsheets. I couldn't imagine doing this without Excel um, to keep track of the characters um, and the variant drafts and to make sure that I had the most, the, 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 the latest version of each chapter where there were many, um, many chapters. But um, it, just, it was just finding the logic of what was there. And there was a clear, strong central story, the story of these agents coming to the IRS um, this this uh, agent named David Foster Wallace, um, this story, case of mistaken identity. So this great elaborate, uh, this great elaborate um, confusion of his arrival, um, which stretched for hundreds of pages right. and was and was a dramatic real time narrative. Then there were the childhood st stories, which clearly they happened before this novel began, and um, 
my job was to try to pace them, to start with the spine and then sort of pace them around the spine so you gradually understood. And I put the story where you finally see the two names appear together relatively early, but not right away, so that the reader would be wondering what's going on but not have to get to the very end of the book to find out that that is what the, who these characters are. Um, and then there are atmospheric pieces about life in the Midwest. Um, and um, I, I chose, I identified each chapter by length, by complexity, mm -hmm. uh, by time period, and just tried to find a flow of them that didn't ever leave you wildly confused and that broke up long passes with short, funny passes. David, as you know, is the, one of the great brilliant comic writers who's ever lived, and so I tried to make sure that the comic paces came along pretty regu regularly. Um, and it was just based on my reading of all of his work in the sense of, um, of it had similarities, what I saw had similarities to Infinite Jest in that it was a lot of, a lot of characters, a lot of different settings, a lot of time periods, and I, so I knew from that how comfortable he was with stretching readers' patience for, right. for, for um, un, um, unresolved, unre unresolved material. So I kind of based it off in Infinite Justice. I sense. wanted to ask you about that. So I mean, because of the kind of the influence of having worked with him for 15 years before you started working on this on this project. Um, that kind of intimacy, I mean, that must have been a, a, a really useful tool, at least in, in terms of trying to channel what his intent must have been, it, or it, might, might have been. It's certainly, it, it's what I had to work with. It's, right. it's what it, and then there was a difficult question of how do you edit the work of a writer who's not there? I talked about editing David while he's alive, and the answer to any editing question is it's the author's decision, absolutely. The editor proposes and suggests and maybe tries to persuade, but what the author wants is what is the book. And when the author is not there to respond, what do you do? Well, you turn to Bonnie Nadal. <laughs> so, what do you, so Bonnie, what do you, what, so as the representative, what, what is, I mean, what is that process like? Did you guys, did you feel that you could alter certain things? Obviously, you're, you're, you're judiciously cutting and, and pasting. I mean, the, that's part of the, a key part of the process. But in terms of um, line by line or places where you think it's confusing or, um, or maybe a little excessive or whatever, what, what is, what well, is that? I suppose, I mean, Michael and I had a lot of conversations about this because it's, after years of having conversations with David of like, this is confusing, this is too hard, you need to cut this, you need to give the reader a few more clues. Um, having, I think what we decided is that even though he couldn't answer the conversation back, we were sort of having the conversation with each other right. of how to cut and how to do things. And I mean, I think if anything, we or we decided that it was better to leave, to leave things as much as possible in his words and in his hands. And so where we cut was where it was confusing or where it was clearly a mistake or um, where a name was not meant to be that name. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, there were drafts over so many years that we, we did things for clarity. Um, but I also sort of, I think my feeling was that just because he couldn't be part of the conversation didn't mean that we shouldn't still have the conversation. And so we had a bunch of really extensive phone conversations where we went back and forth between what we thought was going on. And I still remember there was one point where I'm like, Michael, I don't understand this. I don't know that this is the same woman. Like, I didn't get this at all. And then I think we added, um, we sort of did something that we made it a little bit clearer. Yeah. Um, because there was a couple of things where, um, it needed to become a little clearer. But we didn't change, I mean, there's no words that were changed in right. it. Because it, it's, it, it's very much, it was all Davis' work. And we, oh, I'm sorry. Just say, Bonnie, what Bonnie expressed to me was, we should publish this with this sort of, if this is something you know you would have asked him to change, or that is a really right. basic grammatical or uh, uh, edit that you know he would not in a million years have let out, out of his out of his office. Um, we should. We, we should, should do it for him. We should do that for him. Right. It's something so that, that, right. the kind of editing we knew he accepted from copy editors, or for basic sense, we we did take that liberty. Right. And we should all. I should also. We should also say that you know. I mean, some of this book, or much of this book, is just heart stoppingly beautiful. The writing in the book. Some of the writing is some of the most gorgeous writing that. Um, 
that I've ever read of his. And so I think in that sense too, it's, he, you know, he is funny and he is ambitious and I think sometimes we overlook just the kind of sheer beauty of the sentences. Some of these sentences, um, you know, that description of, some of the descriptions of the Midwest that you were referring to oh my God. Um, are just unbelievable, I, you know. I think every child in America should, be, should get the pleasure of memorizing the opening chapter. I think it's one of the greatest passages in the English language. I just think it's gorgeous beyond, beyond belief. Yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, why I David, put it first. You know, David was, was always a boy of the Midwest, and no matter, even living in California, um, I would say he never really became a Californian. He could appreciate it, but because he was such a Midwesterner um, through and through. Do you want to read a little bit of that? We had talked, I mean, you don't have to, but we had talked, I mean, put you on, slightly put you on the spot. I, know, I saw you grabbing for the book. So. I wasn't grabbing for the book, I was grabbing for my Excel file to show everyone. Oh, well, let's look at the Excel, 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 Excel file. file. <laughs> Make them read the book themselves. <clears throat> it is interesting, too, that it's a book about boredom, but it's also a book about um, acceptance, about coming to terms in a certain way. It feels to me as a reader. Um, that it's a book about coming to terms in a certain sense. So I'm curious about your guys' sense of that and how much of that you felt was sort of woven into what, um, what was there and how much of it was what you pulled out of what was there. I wouldn't say that anything in there is something that I pulled out or enhanced. I mean, I, okay. this book is made up of everything that I felt, everything that was there that fit together and was finished. Um, in the paperback, we've added a uh, we've added four chapters that did not make the that we did not include in the first in the first publication. There were chapters that included the main characters, but in settings that didn't really make sense with everything else that was there. But they're interesting once you've read the book as as extra material. But I just I, I don't mean to be, not be answering your question, but just to to, to, to say I, I would not say that I added any emphasis. I right. think it's all it's all there. But what do you think about acceptance as a subject of the book? You know, I mean, the book is about mindfulness. I mean, David, mm. from, from the speech that he gave um, at Kenyon in 2005, which became the book This Is Water, I mean, clearly what he was trying to figure out in his own life and what he was trying to convey to readers is, of course, a sense of, of mindfulness about the world, of how to how to accept, you know, how to accept certain things about yourself and how to accept certain things about the world. And, you know, for these IRS agents, accepting their lives as grim as they are and creating characters who have to do that. Well, the, Ken the point of that Kenyan address, which is a beautiful piece of writing, is basically, you know, be here, be in your moment now because, or, you know, to quote Ram Dass, who for some reason keeps coming up, <laughs> Of all the 60s icons in the world, you know, I did never realize be here now would be the most profound philosophical statement I ever heard. But that's what, in some way, he's talking about. And it feels to me like that's what the point of The Pale King 2 is also in terms of those IRS agents, whatever the circumstance, be in your, be in your experience now because whatever it is, it's the only experience you're going to get. That is, I think, that mindfulness and acceptance, and it occurs to me, and I wonder your guys' thoughts on this, is that this is sort of, it feels, if you look at the whole body of work, that this is where David was moving towards his arrival. I mean, this idea becomes more and more prevalent in, you know, in the later work, as a, you know, starting perhaps with um, that story, with the Smithy story, which is in Oblivion, um, which may be the first time I became a, really focused on it in his work, and certainly in that address, and certainly in, in The Pale King. I mean, does, do you think this is a mark of his, his process of maturation as a writer in some way? I think so. I mean, David at the beginning was sort of like, look, ma, no hands. Like, I can do funny, I can do sad, I can do scary, like, I can do everything. Um, and like a kid on a bike, because he really could do everything. And... As he got older, he realized that he didn't want to rely on the same tricks he always relied on and didn't want to be the look my no hands writer, you know. And I mean, also, it's a process we all got older. I mean, the person who you are at 24 is not the person you are at 44. Um, we all ideally mature and grow up. And I mean, he was growing up as a writer just the same way he was growing up as a person. Yeah. You know, it was, he was a very different man than he was when I first met him. <laughs> I think he was trying to write about the things that mattered most to him in the world. I think he was trying to address life's, I feel like this book is the evidence of life or death struggle 
with life, um, with art. He was writing about mindfulness and that you want to engage your life every second. But a lot of those seconds are really boring. Right. And I mean, this book, I mean, it's funny about it sometimes, but it's sometimes just staggeringly sad. I mean, it's, 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 it's up and it's up, up pretty far, up very far and it's down as, as, as far as the book can go at the same time. So I think that, um, I, I think he was just trying to think through, understand life in, in first principles, and this book is evidence of a great, great mind uh, struggling with um, the challenge of, of, uh, of ordinariness. Um, he had an extraordinary mind. I think he was, my experience of him, I have a sense he was bored a lot. I think he didn't have many people he could play with um, at the level he wanted to engage. That's why he's, he had great friends like uh, Jonathan Franzen, who was someone who he could engage uh, uh, very powerful. He had his, he met a, uh, and married Karen Green, a brilliant, brilliant woman. Um, but I think for someone with a mind that enormous and complex, I think the world can be a challenging place because I think it can be lonely. So I think the book is a record of this epic struggle with enormous consequence, and we're lucky to have it. Well, I want to thank you guys for uh, a really scintillating hour of, of conversation. Thank you, uh, thank Michael Peach, Bonnie Nadell. Thank you very much.